going now. Okay, we're all in. Um, praise the Lord. I just uh, also thank you all for being part of this, and I pray the Lord will uh, use this to encourage all of us uh, in Him. And um, we get started. My topic is God encounters, and um, I got excited about God encounters, just the experience and the experience of the Lord, just experiencing Him and. Uh, studied it quite a bit and, and with my own relationship with the Lord I just really felt that was what the I should write about and so I'm going to get started right here and the first people I want to acknowledge obviously is Dr. George Parrott, Dr. Nancy G. Daniels. Uh, you guys have been awesome, you've been encouraging us, uh, me personally a lot and I feel like I was thinking about it earlier it's like uh, you spoke things you spoke things into our lives that were not there yet for me personally you spoke things that perhaps you saw things for the future or in the spirit and you encouraged me i it, anyways without your encouragement i would have never done this so uh praise the lord and also the cmm class the encouragement the prophetic words encouraging words throughout the last two years has been just such a blessing so thank you so much um, I just thought I would share in, in just very short, uh, I was born and raised in a religious Mennonite community in Durango, Mexico, um, where we were, we had our own land, uh, maybe about 20,000 acres, I don't know, uh, which was all dedicated, it was just for the Mennonite people, and no Mexicans, no Spanish people were allowed on there, they're not allowed to buy land. The, the, the elder of that whole Mennonite community holds the deed to the, the land and it's not allowed to be sold outside of our community, Mennonite community. And uh, we are the holy people and we're the God's people and we're the ones that are going to heaven and everyone else is going to hell. Um, that was literally what uh, we were taught. Uh, but praise God, he sent missionaries from, uh, I believe it was Manitoba, I know it was Canada. They were from a... Uh, EMMC, that's Evangelical Mennonite Mission Conference, uh, several different ones over a period of time. They were just great, great people that came with love. They came with, uh, I believe, a lot of grace because we were stiff neck and hard. And so anyways, we, over a time period of, short time period, anyways, we begin to hear the gospel, the truth of eternity, uh, eternal life or eternal hell. And so anyways, over time, we my youngest sister was the first to give her life to the Lord, and and I got excited because because she was so full of joy that um, I also wanted to give my life to the Lord. But she had just come from school, and uh, so I was. Catherine likes to tell people the story that I knelt in an outhouse to give my life to the Lord. But, anyways, I I think God can hear us anywhere. That's where I was. Um, I remember very shortly after that, within that time period. I brought one of my aunties home with a horse and buggy. And she said to me that we will go to heaven with horse and buggy and you will drive into hell with your car. Um, that's how strong it was. And uh, so anyways, that was, that was our beginning of getting saved or hearing the true gospel and later moved to Canada um, at the age of 20, 21, 21, 20, 21, I found my wife. We got married in uh, 1996. I was 22, and uh, we're into youth ministry. And then I believe it was 1999 when we were in Pinecrest Bible Training Center where we went to visit, where I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit through uh, the laying on of hands by Way Taylor. And so that was another whole big step for me. That one of the big changes for me at that moment was. Um, it was from that time where I felt like I was hearing the Lord for myself, that God was involved in my life, and it was a relationship. It was not just uh, God out there somewhere. So that's just a little bit about my background. And, uh, and then in 2003, the Lord called us to Ghana, and it's uh, so it's almost 20 years that we're in Ghana. Okay, so the introduction, just in short, God Encounters is for everyone. Uh, one of the, the thoughts that uh, would be very often perceived in my people is that it's only for the big men, it's for the apostles or for the Moses and Elijah and so on. Um, but uh, through studying this, I really notice it even more that it's for people like Gideon, who was a nobody in a sense. He said he was the least of the least. 
It was for the Hebrew boys. It was for the shepherds and so on. And so I'll go into a literature review, meaning of encounter, what others say about God encounters. Uh, we'll take some stories out of the Bible, people who encountered God, stories of God encounters in recent history. And then I go into a portion of looking at key scriptures that we have experienced that are used to say that God doesn't speak and that the gifts are no more and, and so on. And I'll talk about the Holy Spirit, the baptism, and then God speaking. So that's a little bit of an, of an overview. In literature, obviously, I've used the Bible uh, quite a lot, quite a bit, um, different translations, um, commentators, and uh, I've used four books. One was Face to Face with God by Bill Johnson, and uh, Am I Being Deceived by Mark and Patty Verkler, and God Encounters by James and James W. Gall and Michael Ann Gall, and then Like a Mighty Wind by Mel Tarl. So those were the books that I used uh, for literature review. And um, yeah, so the meaning of encounters, um, I have quite a bit of here, but basically what we find from the scriptures, different translation, including the Hebrew meaning and, and uh, what commentators use is simply, it's meeting with God, uh, visitation, meet, uh, meeting up with him, a conversation with him, um, like we see here, in the, in the Old Testament, where God says that he will encounter them in uh, Hosea 13, verse 8 there. In the New Testament there, it speaks there of meeting God, which is the same when we look at the Hebrew and the Greek, it's the same meaning. It's encountering the Lord Jesus um, there. So I think everybody knows what that word means. But for me, I had to study it a little bit and just see what, what it really meant. So um, different, different translations. Um, in uh, of the Bible, and as well as uh, commentators that use it differently, but all the same meaning, you know, just um, meeting up with God, having a meeting with him face to face or conversation, just encountering the Lord. So what others say about God encounters? Um, I noticed when I started studying this that so many people were actually using this word, ministries named after uh, using that word in their names and in testimonies. And so I, I noticed that it was actually way more out there than what I thought in, in different, maybe different people groups than, than, uh, than uh, more of my Mennonite people, but uh, it's there. A lot of people are using that word. So um, I have quite a bit here, but I'll just mention the main point here. And if I can move something here a little bit, there we go. Okay, so this guy, I kind of like reading his book because, uh, you know, he talks about how they knew the Bible well and so on, but um, they didn't see the power, they didn't experience God. And when God showed up, uh, you know, basically the missionaries left. It's like the missionaries didn't know what to do with the presence of God and they ended up leaving and God used him mightily and, and many others in, uh, in his uh, hometown, in his village. So... Uh, I, I really liked his book, Like a Mighty Wind. Um, James Gall, uh, God gives relatory graces to his children to reveal in us into a desperate and needy world the glorious person of his son, Jesus Christ. That revelation has life-changing power, uh, not only for non-believers brought to faith because of it, but also for believers whose faith walk in ministry is forever transformed by a personal God encounter. I thought that was a powerful statement he made there. Bill Johnson, uh, truth that are, truths that are not experienced are, in effect, more like theories than truths. Whenever God reveals truth to us, he is inviting us into a divine encounter. Um, uh, powerful and, and I believe that so many times we have we have had theories we've had theology or you know what we believed and and uh, without experience without the real encounter and in, in uh, it being a personal revelation and 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 uh, it, it being a reality in us so yeah some of our most notable heroes of the faith had moments in which God invaded their lives in ways that were often unique sometimes hard to believe and, but I think with, with this, one of the things that happens, we looked at the fruit of their lives later and, and we just have to believe that they were of the Lord and 
Um, yeah, so anyways, Rick Joyner's, he talks about the church, the setup of the church, the early church and so on, and how the structure was. And he says, this made the church the most dynamic and unique uh, entity the world had ever seen. Multitudes were drawn to it as they were born again by powerful personal encounters with Christ through his Holy Spirit. So now that's from Rick Joyner. Um, Darren Wilson, millions around the world love God, but also struggle with doubt, religious fatigue, and a desire for something more. WP is a place designed where you can find the more of God. The films, shows, and specials are all part, part of a larger journey beyond the four walls of the church into a world that needs an encounter with God more than ever. Um, Mike Bickle, this is critical for the seven churches, and he's talking here about the seven churches and specifically about the eyes of Jesus. Uh, he's talking about Jesus in this portion, and then so he says this is critical for these seven churches to encounter not just the doctrine of the Messiah, but to encounter the man with the eyes of fire. Um, I, I, I like that, especially since we studied the book of Revelation, the, the seven churches quite a bit over the last couple of years, and um, yeah, to personally encounter the eyes of the Lord, and uh, yeah, that's powerful. And and this book as well, um, really enjoyed it. He, um, these people, Mark and Petty Berkler, they had, um, well, he he called himself a Pharisee, <laughs> or, or he says he was a Pharisee, and he talks about how Pharisees miss the moving of God in their own generation. They are fixed on the laws of God from generations ago and are uh, adamantly opposed to the, any direct encounter with God themselves. They have built a religious set of rules and principles telling about a God who lived and moved and acted miraculously in days past. However, there is no direct encounter with him today in their lives. And so obviously he says this is not Christianity because Christianity demands a direct encounter and personal relationship with God through his son, Jesus Christ. And so... Um, I can identify with them because that's sort of what I also come out of. And uh, at the same time, uh, I say I come out of that from the Mennonite background. There are many, many of the Mennonite people, the uh, evangelical uh, Christians that we know, churches who love God, who have uh, come a long ways, even where we are right now in uh, the area here in Kansas, just really feel that people love the Lord. And, and just they're using the scriptures, they're, they're choosing to not base their beliefs and theology on uh, what tradition says, but they're going to the Bible, to the word of God and seeing what does the Bible really say. And so um, I, I'm seeing that more and more uh, churches are really growing and moving in the things of the spirit and the things of God. And so that's that's been exciting for me to see, um, especially among friends. So. God encounters in the Bible. Um, I'm going to just look at a few stories here. I'll make it short, but um, witnesses from the Bible of those who encountered God. Uh, there's there's so many different ones in the Bible. Those who were caught up into heaven, those who experienced the Lord coming down to them and um, others physically being carried by the spirit to, um, you know, to locations like Ezekiel or even in the New Testament. Uh, Philip, who baptized the eunuch, you know, the spirit carries him away. And um, and so there was many and face-to-face -face encounters with the Lord. And so I just picked a few of them here, just go over them a bit quick. But uh, obviously from the beginning, Adam and Eve, uh, God created man in his image and his likeness. And I believe a part of that was for the purpose of fellowship, of relationship. And um, I believe Adam and Eve had a perfect union, a relationship with the Lord until sin came in. Um, as it says that uh, Adam and Eve, that they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the cool of the evening. And so um, Way Taylor used to say the Lord God walking speaks of a relationship. He's walking. He has something to say today, but tomorrow he will say something again. Um, it's, it's, it's a continual relationship, a walk with the Lord. So uh, that was, that's, uh, yeah, Genesis 3, 8 there, Adam and Eve, but that relationship was lost through sin. And yet throughout the Bible, we find people who had amazing, amazing um, encounters and relationships with the Lord. 
Noah had a testimony of walking with God, who was righteous, a man that was found to, uh, yeah, to be a righteous man, blameless in his generation. And Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Um, Noah built the ark on the word of the Lord. I, I believe it's a bit over 100 years that it took Noah to build the ark after God spoke to him. And uh, all the ridicule and opposition, you know, to build an ark on dry ground when God says it's going to rain, and yet it had never rained. We believe it had never rained up to that point. And so in, in some ways, you know, and I use some pictures here of, you know, there may be Sunday school pictures, but just I, I like visuals. So, um, you know, people there, and, and it's just, I can just imagine the ridicule and mocking and, and laughter and so on from people and, and for a hundred years, but uh, Noah must have really had a, a great relationship with the Lord to uh, to build the ark until it was done. Um, then there's Abraham. Uh, I love this story where these three visitors come to Abraham. And um, you all know the story. And, and uh, I, some of you, I, I hope, is still an encouragement. But for any other people that may see all of this or hear this, uh, maybe some who don't believe in, in um, God still being you know, alive today or speaking today in, in continuationism. I, I hope this will be an encouragement, but like Adam, uh, Abraham, he had this profound relationship with the Lord. And, and so here come these three people to them and, and, you know, they tell them about that they're going to have a baby and they're so old already. And Sarah laughs in, in the room and, and, uh, you know, Abraham had laughed earlier on in one of the encounters. And it's just, I, I see them having some kind of a relationship that is um, that is an amazing relationship, just the way they, you know, they could talk with him like face to face. And anyways, these three men, um, when they want to leave, Abraham walks with them. Um, it says that uh, at, at some point, so three visitors come at, as the three had out from Abraham's house, Abraham sends them off. So it uses the word, I think, sends them off. And so basically it means Abraham will go up to a point and then he'll come back. But as they're walking out, at some point, two of them move on. And one of them stays with Abraham. And when we read those scriptures there, I, I just put one of the scriptures here, but it says, while Abraham was still standing before the Lord, that was God. And so one of the three was the Lord himself. And, um, it's just what a profound encounter he had that God was there in person with Abraham, talking with him face to face. And, um, and yet we find in the scripture, it says, uh, there's this one scripture, and, and I didn't put it here, but it's something about that no man can see God and live. And interestingly, Gideon later, when he sees uh, the angel of the Lord, and he says later, I have seen the Lord. And it's like he's afraid of dying, and God says, no, you will not die. <laughs> so it's kind of interesting. Um, but he saw the Lord. Um, here's David. And, and one of the reasons I chose David is he was a little shepherd boy. And we know about shepherds here in Ghana, those that take care of cows and the sheep. They are usually the somehow the nobodies. And, uh, you know, just recently, I don't know if some of you have probably seen the picture that I posted of this little, little boy, little, little cowboy. And uh, anyway, we often see them here. They are, they are of the low class people considered of the nobody somehow. And um, I see that from David, you know, Samuel goes there, God has called him to anoint the king. And here comes the big brothers, the machos, and, and Samuel makes a mistake, judging outwardly and wants to anoint them. And everyone, God says, no, God says, no. And then uh, finally, uh, Samuel asks, is there yet another one? And well, yeah, there's, there's David, the little shepherd boy <laughs> among the sheep, whatever. And so he said, well, we're not going to sit until he comes. And so he, uh, he gets anointed as king. He probably goes, I think he goes back to the sheep, but he becomes king. But he came out of a situation that was probably seen as this, this cowboy, this shepherd boy who Maybe there's not that much hope in him of becoming anything great, but yet he becomes the king. Uh, so David had encountered, you know, the lion and the bear when nobody saw him, probably. And the time came when he was in public, uh, 
between two nations, the Philistines and, and Israel, and everybody, the whole nation of Israel fears the Philistines, and, and David basically says, well, who's this uncircumcised Philistine? And, and we know the story, he ends up slaying the Philistine, and so he, it's like God saw his heart in the bush as a worshiper, and the Lord uh, used them to display his glory and his power to two nations at once, and so um, that was just an awesome story. Little boy David becomes this mighty man of valor, mighty man of God, and, and has this encounter with the Lord. And so Gideon, you probably know the story of Gideon in the book of Judges, chapter 6. Uh, you know, Israel is being oppressed and, and, uh, for 40 years, and Gideon is trying to save his crop out in the field, and all of a sudden, the angel of the Lord shows up. And uh, the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, the Lord is with you, O valiant warrior. And he says, go in this your strength and deliver Israel from the hand of Midian. Have I not sent you? And so Gideon says, well, uh, you know, he thinks he's a nobody. He said to him, O Lord, how shall I deliver Israel? Behold, my family is the least in Manasseh, and I am the youngest in my father's house. So I'm the least of the least. I'm the nobody among the nobodies. <laughs> And anyways, uh, the next scripture here, O oh Lord God, for now I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. The Lord is said to him, peace to you. Do not fear. You shall not die. So in this whole encounter, you know, uh, Gideon is this whole conversation, the angel of the Lord. And, and uh, at some point, finally, this is actually the Lord. And uh, this man who was the least of the least obeys every instruction of the Lord destroys his father's idol, which is huge, because here in Ghana, we see how people fear the demonic powers behind these set of idols. But Gideon is willing to destroy his father's idol and obeys the, the word of the Lord and, and uh, defeats uh, the enemy, and Israel is saved. Um, so there's the um, three Hebrew boys. I think I'll leave them out uh, just for time's sake. Um, the shepherds in the New Testament why did God not send the angels to the Pharisees, to the priests, when he sent them out to the, to the shepherds? And again, just thinking of the shepherds out in the field, just like David. Um, and, I, and I always, I, when I looked at all of these, and I just felt like uh, one is either the people were already anticipating God or pursuing God, or somehow God in his foreknowledge knew that if he would encounter them, that they would honor that. And um, so the shepherds, obviously, after this encounter with the angels showing up, they uh, go and find out what has happened. And sure, they see the, the Messiah has really been born, has come. And they go out and, and, and tell everyone the good news. Um, makes you wonder what the Pharisees would have done if the angels had appeared to the Pharisees. Whether they would have believed, whether they would even have gone out to see um, because we find that the Pharisees, they handed Jesus over because of jealousy. And so, anyways, the shepherds, they responded in a way that honored and glorified the Lord. And, and that is one of my points with, with all of these encounters as well, is that if we truly encounter the Lord, um, the result of that, there, there's fruit there. There's um, We honor the Lord for it and so on. And we have Cornelius, uh, who gets visited by an angel, Um and, and a Gentile, he's not of the Jews, and he's actually a, um, a centurion, a government official, and uh, this is another one of those things that many people, many within churches that I know, uh, the government, oh, the government is all evil, it's, uh, if anybody's a Christian, he cannot be in the government, and so that was one of the reasons I chose someone like Cornelius, it's that, um, there are great men and women of God out there in politics and the government and uh, uh, trying to serve the Lord in that area where they're called. So, and um, so Cornelius, anyways, this this whole in, in Acts chapter ten, this whole encounter, you know, the angel comes and this whole conversation he has with them, and in so many of these encounters, it's like God appears in the form of a human being, and yet it's the Lord or it's an angel, and so. Uh, and then always the result of that, always the result of that. This opened the door for, for the gospel coming to the Gentiles. Um, so when it comes to encounters, I, I realized I had to really deal with some scriptures. And uh, that's where I want to get into some scriptures right now. 
And, um, you know, Jesus said um, that I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. And he was talking about the Holy Spirit. And again, he says, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him and will come to and we will come to him and make our abode with him. So every born again believer that's truly really born again has the Holy Spirit. He came to us in the form of the Holy Spirit. And um, in Revelation chapter 320, Jesus says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and will dine with him and he with me. And so we just see from these scriptures, even before Jesus left the earth, um, you know, he talked to them that I will not leave you as orphans. We will come to you and make our abode with you. And then here in Revelation, he says that if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, we will come in and, and dine with you. So just we see this desire that the Lord has to, to be united with the church or for the church to be united with him and to be in fellowship. And so... This whole thing, really, the opposition that I've seen in this area is uh, this belief of cessationism, um, where people basically, so basically cessationism basically says that God stopped speaking and the spiritual gifts have ceased along with the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the gifts of tongues, the gift of healing, uh, the gift of prophecy, um, as well as, so the pro apostle, the prophet, and the evangelist, all of them. They have all ceased. Um, these ended with the dying of the first century apostles and the Bible being completed. Um, there is therefore no revelation from God or the Holy Spirit. And the only revelation the Holy Spirit does give is he reveals the written word to us as we read it. But he does not speak or in any form give any other revelation. And so uh, I came across uh, Calvinism uh, or John Calvin here who uh, speaks on this topic very strongly, very clearly. And he says, but the gift of, the, of hearing disappeared with the other miraculous powers, which the Lord was pleased to give for a time that it might render the new preaching of the gospel forever wonderful. And I don't understand his statement here, how he puts that together, but basically he says that uh, these gifts, the miraculous gifts uh, are no more for us today. Uh, therefore, even were, were we to grant that anointing was a, a sacrament of those powers which were then administered by the hands of the apostle, apostles, it pertains not to us, to whom no such powers have been committed. So very clearly teaches it doesn't pertain to us. It's not for us today. Um, he continues and he talks about the healing, the laying on of hands and healing. And he talks about James, you know, he, he, he talks from the book of James and he says, James spake uh, agreeably to the time when the church still enjoyed this blessing from God. They affirm indeed that there is still the same virtue in their unction, but we experience differently. And so some of his writings, the way it's termed in, in old English, uh, it's sometimes a bit hard to understand there, but basically he says that the, this gift of healing, the laying on of hands and healing is not for us today. It has ceased. It has stopped. Um, let me just see here. This thing is getting in my way. There we go. Uh, he continues, it deserves attention also of the five offices. So this is the fivefold ministry, the apostle, the prophet, the um, evangelist, the pastor, and the teacher. He says, um, not more than the last two are intended to be perpetual. Apostles, evangelists, and prophets were bestowed on the church for a limited time only, except in those cases where religion has fallen into decay and evangelists are raised up in an ex extraordinary manner to restore the pure doctrine which had been lost. But without pastor and teacher, there can be no government of the church. So prophet and, and apostle are completely gone, and the evangelist is only in those specific uh, situations. That he's raised up just for a period of time. Coming about 500 years later uh, to our age today, we have, um, like John MacArthur, <laughs> um, you know, it's good to be challenged when, when we believe something, right? So he says, uh, he says um, cessationism simply defines the belief that the New Testament miraculous gifts cease. That has been the normative historical view of the church. 
through the church's life, going all the way back to the New Testament and on into the modern era. And so that was his statement. And he later mentions the prophets, the apostles, tongues, words of knowledge, words of wisdom, healings, the miraculous, divine revelation, and even the gift of discernment as all having ceased with what they call the apostolic age and the finalizing of the written word, the Bible. So that's what we face in, in many circles. Uh, we have faced that quite a number of times from different churches. And, uh, and I realize some of these churches that uh, believe this, they, they will quote John MacArthur. They will quote his, his teachings and his writings and his speaking. So um, that's why I chose to listen to some of the things that he had to say and, and see how it plays into this whole belief here. So the opposite of cessationism, basically, they use the word continuationism. <laughs> um, and there's a lot of people that actually don't believe in the cessationism, even among our Mennonite people. Many of them don't believe in that. And um, so it says from here, okay, the fear of man. From here, we go to scriptures about God still speaking and all the gifts still being for today. And uh, the fear of man is a hindrance to come out of cessation. I and mean, this is a big one. The fear of man comes on people. And it's like we fear them. We fear what they will think. We fear what they will say. And uh, because I've experienced it and, and praise the Lord, I've been delivered and set free from that. I, I don't want to unnecessarily offend anyone. But um, the fact is, um, out of love, respect for the word of God and the love for people, I, I believe we need to be boldly declaring the word of God. And, and uh, out of love, I believe we can get, uh, get a long ways, even if we don't believe the same. And uh, people can hear you when you have love. So God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. So God is still speaking. God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in his son. This is one of the scriptures that is used often in saying that God spoke in the Old Testament through the prophets. And now uh, and, and when Jesus came, he spoke through Jesus. And now he no longer speaks. So uh, Barnes commentary says here, just at the end here, he says it might be a very long period, but it would be the last one of which God would speak. And so far as the meaning of the phrase is concerned, it might be the longest period or longer than all the period other others put together. But still, it would be the last one. So this would be the last time that the Lord would speak. He was not going to speak again. Um God's still speaking in many ways. Jesus said that the Holy Spirit would speak to us, right? In John 14, 2, um, that he will teach us all things, that he will guide us into the truth. And whatever he hears, he will speak. And so I would get back to the uh, Hebrew chapter 1, which I just had back here, which um, I believe God still speaks in various ways, just like then. Yes, he spoke through Jesus, but he still speaks. That scripture... I don't see that in any form or way that it can be applied that it says that God no longer would speak, but that's how it is used often. In the Holy Spirit specifically, it says, Jesus says here that he will speak. He will speak to us. Um, so we need the Holy Spirit and we need the word, the word of God. Uh, Wade Taylor, he used to say that if we have only the word, we will dry up. If we have only the spirit, we will blow up. But if we have the word and the spirit, we will grow up. And so, yes, we need the word of God, but we also need the Holy Spirit. Um, the Bible is the written word of God. And I know that there are many issues with people um, carelessly, it seems, saying, oh, God told me to do this or God told me to do that. And sometimes you follow that for a while and certain people and you realize the fruit of it and you realize that maybe God didn't speak. Um, and, and so I believe it is important that when God does speak, that we value it, that we honor that. And, and, and if we really are people who love God and, and love his word, love his ways, then, then the result of it will, will bear fruit if God has really spoken to us. So, and, and if, we, if the Lord does speak to us, I believe the, the scriptures, the Bible, the written word of God um, is like... Uh, like a guidepost for us. Uh, it, our, the word needs to be 
uh, test it with the written word of God. And so this scripture is used a lot that all scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. And so they will say that it, the, the word of God is written and it's, it's adequate for every work of God. Why then do we need uh, revelation? Why do we need prophecy and so on? And um, it's interesting when we look at the word here, it's uh, the, the, um, the Greek here, it's uh, graphe, or however you would pronounce that. And it's talking about a documented written word of God. Um, later, Paul said that faith comes from hearing the word of God. And when we look at that word, their word, it's rhema. It's the spoken word of God, the present word of God. And when Jesus said, man shall not live on bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God, it's the same word rhema. It's we need to hear God, the present word. And it's the same thing when Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. Um, we, we need to hear, even if he speaks through the written word, we need to hear when he speaks to us. And uh, I needed the rhema word to come to Ghana. There's, you know, obviously in scripture, it says that we should go into all the world, making disciples of, uh, of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and so on, commanding them to uh, observe all the commandments and so on. But it, nowhere in the Bible does it say that Jacob read a cup in 2003, uh, pack up and move to Ghana. It just, there's there's so many practical things or things in our lives. We need a word from the Lord. We need to hear from him. And and so often he, he confirms it through scripture. But uh, in this case, for us to go to Ghana, it was one of those things again, where, you know, people find it hard to believe, oh, God is sending you to Ghana. Well, where is the mission board that's sending you? Where's the church that's sending you? Um, but we had so many things that happened, and, and uh, we just really believed the Lord was sending us to Ghana. We went to uh, we went to three people when we started thinking that something was happening. The Lord was maybe moving us on, and uh, we shared it with three people. And we said to them clearly, we said, we don't want your advice, uh, opinion, because I really felt this was big. I said, we need a word from the Lord. And so we ended up in a small uh, church, very, very small Indian reserve church with maybe 20 people, very small group. And uh, the man that we had shared with, he said, just let the pastor pray for you, um, that often the Lord would give him something. So I did. I went forward to be prayed for. And I just, he asked me what I wanted prayer for. And I just told him, I want God's will for my life. He began to pray for the mind of Christ and so on. And then at one point he, he says that what you will be doing is very different than what you have been doing. You know what it means. I don't. And he just continued continue to pray. And I knew immediately because there was three ministries in Mexico that were asking us to come and minister in Mexico, which was similar type of ministry as what we were doing as youth ministry at that moment in Canada. And going to Ghana was very different. We had met with the lady that we had been in Ghana with in 1999. This was now 2003. And so he says, what you will be doing is very different and you know what it means. And I knew right away, I just knew. And so some people find it so difficult. Well, how can you take that and say, God is sending you to Ghana? Well, we just know by the spirit, right? When we uh, begin to walk with him and the Lord confirmed it through scripture later, right? The Lord very clearly gave me scripture, uh, a couple of different ones, different times and in different ways. Uh, first he spoke through man, then he, by the spirit led me through scripture and, um, just so many ways the Lord has spoken to us so many times. And and one of the things just recently the Lord spoke to me was I was really concerned about my children's future. And that was like three years ago, maybe, maybe four, three, four. And um, I was thinking about their future and I'm thinking about how some of our relatives, our, our sisters and brothers who are saving up for their, their children, who have bank accounts for them and so on. And and it just kind of bothered me. And uh, I was in the morning, I was traveling that day with somebody and we ended up at somebody's house for the night, some missionary's house up in the north of Ghana. And we lay down for the evening, for the night. And, and there was a flashing light of an angel in the room that just, it just appeared once. And both of us, we saw, we knew, we knew that it was an angel in the room. And, 
And so we were talking. All of a sudden, at one point, uh, this uh, person that was with me, he says, Jake, I just feel like the Lord is saying that um, your children's future is secure in my hands. And and I just knew the Lord had spoken. And uh, we've experienced this so clearly. Last year when Lily got engaged, um, and, and, and they were thinking they wanted the wedding to be in the U.S., and I'm thinking the wedding in, in, in Ghana would be much cheaper. And coming to can to to the U.S. Uh, flights again can be around nine thousand U.S. dollars, and we don't have that. <laughs> we don't have that money personally, and I'm not sure we can take this from the ministry because this is personal. And what we felt that was the way the Lord was that it was okay that perhaps the Lord was leading it that way. This year, I think it was somewhere January, uh, had a text message uh, from uh, one of Catherine's family members and said that. Lord had put it on his heart and he said he had put he, he said he put ten thousand dollars into our personal account and it was I, I just knew it was the Lord answering you know he had said he his my children's future is secure in him and I just knew that it was one of those things I I could trust the Lord and he definitely he was going to take care of everything and so so many times the Lord has spoken and so we need the Rhema word we always need the Rhema word the age of miracles is one of those things, too, that they say is gone. It's no more for us. Focus on the family was talking about those who believe in uh, the uh, miraculous or in, in cessationism. And, and this is what they said about the miraculous, basically saying that those signs and miracles of the book of Acts uh, were there for establishing the truth and validity of the gospel in the earliest days of the its progress of the church, you know. But then he says, once the New Testament was written, uh, they were no longer necessary. And thus, <coughs> <coughs> and so they ceased to exist. So <coughs> this whole thing of miracles and healing and so on, I know there's been a lot of abuse, a lot of issues, but we can't throw out the baby with the bathwater, as they would say. I was in a, in a, village with a group of people and I noticed that in the village the people of the village there was uh, just too many people with eye problem and I wanted to pray for just I wanted to pray you know sometimes the Lord heals and and sometimes the Lord gives us answers and understanding what the issue is <coughs> and the team that I was there with a different uh, team the leader of that team immediately very quickly pulled out his whole team and they were not allowed to join me to pray. And um, so then the question came, are you healing or is God healing? And I'm just, uh, anyways, it's just the fear of some of this belief in, in some of these things. So Jesus did miracles because he was moved with compassion. And so what we are told so strongly is that Jesus and the apostles, they needed the miracles to prove their, who they were, to validate the, the gospel, to validate this, uh, what they were doing and, and to write the scriptures. And so with Jesus, he was anointed with the Holy Spirit and with power to heal the sick, to preach the gospel, to um, heal the brokenhearted, to uh, set the captives free, Luke 4, 9, 18 and 19. And then um, in Acts 10, Acts 10, um, it says that he was anointed with the Holy Spirit and with power. And so we find so many times, actually a good number of times, he doesn't want them to tell them that, like those that he had healed, he didn't want them to tell who he was. And uh, so I'm thinking if he really did these signs and miracles because he needed to validate who he was, wouldn't he let them tell who he was? Many times he didn't, he told them not to. And, and so when I looked at this, I began to see that Jesus was moved with compassion so many times. There's the widow that's on her way out to bury her son. Uh, and Jesus had compassion on, on her and, and raised the, the dead son. Uh, he multiplied the food and the, the bread and the fish because he had compassion on the people out there. In so many places, we find that he had compassion. And here in Matthew 9, 36, going, you know, it says, seeing the people, he felt compassion for them because they were distressed 
and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. And so I believe Jesus did miracles and healings because the people needed it and he had compassion on them, not because he needed to validate who he was. And so the other thing is that the gifts and, and uh, the anointing or the power to heal and all of this, I believe is only for the apostles. It's not for us today. And so I looked at Stephen, who was of the deacons, one of the seven, and it says he was performing great wonders and signs among the people, and he was not an apostle. Philip, one of the seven, and uh, I believe this is quite clear that he is one of the seven. We find that some of the commentators also make comment of that. <clears throat> so he was one of the seven. We could say he was appointed to serve tables, a deacon. <laughs> he was not an apostle. And so he went to Samaria, and he's there uh, preaching and teaching the word of God. And it says the crowds with one accord were giving attention to what was said by Philip as they heard and saw the signs which he was performing. For in the case of many who had unclean spirits, they were coming out of them shouting with a loud voice, and many who had been paralyzed and lame were healed. And so this, these two here specifically, they are not of the apostles, and yet they so strongly say that is only for the apostles. And so I saw this in, in these scriptures that this was not of the, they were not of the apostles. Um, they were deacons serving tables and yet mightily walking in the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And so I begin to really see from the scriptures that the greater works in, in, in all of this, it's really for those who believe. Uh, Jesus is truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also and greater works than these he will do because I go to the Father. And... Um, Mark 16, verse 16, he who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved, but he who has disbelieved shall be condemned. And so we look at verse 16 here, Mark 16, verse 16, that scripture is no problem. But Jesus didn't stop there. He says, these signs will accompany those who have believed in my name. They will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will pick up serpents. And if they drink any deadly poison, it will not hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. And so it's like verse 16, we have no problem. That scripture is used. But 17 and 18, oh, that was only for the apostle. That's not for us today. And so, you know, there's so many of these scriptures where I begin to see is that, well, if so many of the script scriptures are only for the apostles or only for the ones that Jesus talked to, then, then we're in big trouble because then we got to say that John 3, chapter 3 is only for Nicodemus. It's not for us. For God so loved the world, oh, that was just for Nicodemus. It's not for us. Um, and so I, 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 here we see so clearly, it's for him who believes, even the greater works. He who believes in me. And um, yeah, if we would just believe, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and uh, we shall be saved and believe in, in, in have faith in him and, and, and the miraculous and all the things, all the gifts of the spirit, <clears throat> including... The gift of discernment uh, was one of those things that was spoken of uh, through MacArthur, John MacArthur. And, and I don't want to condemn him. I don't know him personally. Um, I'm just using those quotes because it's something that I personally have dealt with uh, with different churches and so on. So it's not about condemning the person, but it's the belief, the, 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 the way the scriptures are interpreted and stuff, which I believe is not right. So... I believe, you know, so often we just know by the spirit and Paul says the natural man does not accept the things of the spirit of God. And I believe to the degree, to the level that we are still bound in the natural things, we, the, the, we cannot accept the things of the spirit. God is spirit. Those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Um, the, the whole birth, uh, being born again, it's a spiritual birth. We're born of the spirit, born of the blood and born of the water. It's, it's a spiritual thing that we're born again. And so we begin to learn to walk by the spirit. Paul talks about walking by the spirit and not by the flesh. And so we, we really want to live by the spirit, walk by the spirit, know things by the spirit. So receiving revelation is one of those very serious things with some of these people. They're just so very strongly against it. 
And uh, so like Ephesians chapter 1, 17, 18, I've never, I don't think I've ever heard anybody speak on that particular scripture or have it prayed until the later years where I, I think it was more with Morningstar and Pinecrest and, and CMM where we began to see these kind of scriptures. Um, and very interestingly, how we got connected with, with Morningstar and then CMM through that. Um, I found a, a, this little booklet that Rick Joyner had done by, uh, or that he had done on uh, overcoming witchcraft. I saw that little booklet in a, in a, in a small shop in a metal container that was uh, in Adidome, which is uh, about an hour from where we live right now in Ghana at the missionary house. And I thought, okay, witchcraft, we're in Ghana, there's a lot of witchcraft. So I thought I'd read it and learn about it. And anyways, I was very surprised by what I learned about witchcraft in the church and so on. But the end, I think it was at the end of that book or some other book later that I, we also got, and I knew it was about Morningstar, I realized that Rick Joyner was doing the weekly word of the uh, word and he posted it online. So I started going to the town every week to go and get that word printed out. And that was that was really our only source of, of really any connection with any spiritual uh, support or any spiritual food coming from anyone uh, besides just me and Catherine and, and this missionary lady that was here was for a very short time and then we moved on we were on our own and so we were really blessed by that and so that's how we got connected with Morningstar and and began to see and, and through Pinecrest as well we had really began to see these kind of scriptures but that's how we got connected with Morningstar and then CMM there um, but the whole thing of you know, Paul prayed for the spirit of wisdom and of revelation and the knowledge of him, that the eyes of your understanding or your heart, right, might be enlightened. And so these are the words like being enlightened or revelation. There are words that are a bit hard to receive by some people. <clears throat> they believe that it's too dangerous because we will receive demonic powers. And I believe Jesus has covered this when he talked about you know, asking you shall receive, knock and door shall be open and so on. And he goes on and he says that if you then uh, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? And and he also talks about there that, uh, yeah, so, so if we being evil, he says, uh, so I should back up here a bit, but that we wouldn't give our children a scorpion or a snake. And I believe they imply their uh, demonic things. And so I believe Jesus has covered that. And he says, you know what? We can ask and God will protect us. It's not, we, we're, we don't need to be afraid of receiving the demonic. And although I know the demonic is real, there, there's, there's many things out there. I know that. But if we genuinely ask the Lord for the Holy Spirit, um, he'll give us the Holy Spirit. He will not give us uh, snakes and scorpions, demonic things. And, and so this was a real good scripture scripture when I saw this scripture some time ago some years ago that um, for my people who are so afraid of oh you're going to get uh, uh, demonic things and and so on and just realize no we don't need to be afraid we can be at peace we can be yeah so the last scripture that I have here is the perfect this is the last scripture on this uh, chapter here on this and this is one of the scriptures that's used very much that when the perfect comes, then, you know, love, uh, prophecy, knowledge, and, and tongues will cease. They'll be done away with. And so they say that the scripture is the perfect. The, the written word of God is the perfect. The Bible is complete. Now we don't need it. And so anyways, when we study this, I need to hurry up here a little bit. When we study this, we see that Paul is talking here about a mature, a, a, a maturing process. It, it has, This word perfect here is not has nothing to do with writing a document. This is a word about maturity. And as I, I have this uh, here in the bottom, it says this phrase, that which is perfect is translated from the Greek word uh, teleos. And so this speaks of a maturing process of labor, growth, mental and moral character, et cetera, a full age and, and, and so on. So um, let me see, I think I have the other one here too. So anyways, basically, you know, the church, Paul talks about the fivefold ministry for the purpose of maturing, of coming into the full statue of the Lord Jesus Christ, the fullness. And, and again, we see that idea of maturity. And Paul uses that on himself and he uses that for the uh, uh, 
Colossians, I think it is, yes, Colossians there, and also Philippians where he talks about himself, about this process of maturing and becoming fully complete in Christ Jesus and, and the body of Christ. He wants to see the Colossian church. He wants to see them complete and mature in Christ. And that is the whole idea there. Whereas the um, the Greek word incomplete would be an area of a document would be a different word as we see here, uh, completing a task such as writing or compiling a document or the scriptures would be uh, pleru, however you pronounce that. And so we do not find this word perfect in 1 Corinthians there. And so uh, we, we cannot apply and say that the perfect was already there the Bible is complete and that perfect is done. And so there's no more gifts. Um, there's too many other scriptures that are also in agreement with this idea of maturing uh, into the fullness of Christ. And I believe we would all come to agree that we haven't reached there yet. It's the, the body of Christ has not fully matured yet. And so we need all the gifts. We need the prophets, the apostles, the evangelists, the teachers and the pastors. We need them all. Holy Spirit encounters, I'm just going to point out in short here, the seal of the Holy Spirit when we're born again, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, according to Acts chapter 2, and I'm being filled again and again. <laughs> um, so there's there's quite a lot of scriptures here that I have here, but uh, Jesus, after his resurrection, he appeared to the disciples, he breathed on them and told them, receive the Holy Spirit, and I believe they received him. You know, it's like the seal of the Holy Spirit, that stamp, that seal, that pledge of the Holy Spirit that Paul talks about. And then before he went off to heaven, Jesus said to the disciples that they should wait for the promise. And, you know, John the Baptist had talked about, you know, he says, I baptize you with water, but one is coming after me. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And so the whole baptism of fire is yet another topic, uh, which I think we need to talk some time about, or I need to learn more about, and um, perhaps a, a sanctifying work. But anyways, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So Jesus says, wait, wait for that promise. And so for 10 days, they wait there and, and uh, the Holy Spirit comes upon them. But this whole thing of the seal of the Holy Spirit, the stamp, and, you know, the book of Aster talks about that thing of the seal and there's no revoking it and so on. And so I believe when we're truly born again, the Holy Spirit comes in us and there's something of a seal, there's something of a stamp and, and a mark of God on us. And Nobody can take that away from us. We we belong to the Lord. And that's for everybody in the whole world. Anybody that's born again. It's that mark of the Holy Spirit, that seal of the Holy Spirit that sets us apart uh, from the world. And we become a family, brothers and sisters in Christ, belonging to God. Um, yeah, I think I'll go on here. And so what one of the big problems is, again, in, in some of our um, cultures and churches is this whole thing of, oh, the second experience. They believe you can have a second experience. And, um, well, I think there are many experiences in the Lord when we walk with him. But anyways, um, I, again, I tried to look at scriptures. And so one of, there's a couple of them. One is in Acts 19, but then this one here in Acts uh, 8, 14 to 18, where uh, Philip goes to Samaria, preaches the gospel, and, and many people get saved, get healed, and, and so on, and baptized. But uh, when the apostles in Jerusalem hear about it, they come down and they lay hands on them and they receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And so I be believe, I, I believe when once you believe and you give yourself over for baptism, I believe you're saved. And in this case, we don't know the time span there really. It may not have been long, but it could have been, could have been months. And so I, I believe they were saved. They probably had somewhat of a seal and in, in, in some deliverance, whatever, healing and so on. They encountered God, but they received the baptism of the Holy Spirit when the apostles came and laid hands on them. And so it's just one of those things again. Well, because for me personally, I, I believe I was saved. I, I believe I was saved. When those missionaries came from Canada, and we got I believe we got saved. We got uh, taken out of the kingdom of darkness, confusion, and religion, out of the kingdom of Satan. And I, I believe we were placed in the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ because we believed. And we we committed ourselves to, to that belief and wanted to follow that and, and follow the Lord Jesus. And, and obviously, it wasn't the fullness of it, and it was the beginning and so on. But 
uh, I believe we were saved, but the baptism of the Holy Spirit that I experienced for me personally was was many years later. Uh, was at Pinecrest Bible Training Center when Wade Taylor laid hands on my wife and myself. And my wife had already received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but I had not. And But anyways, he just laid hands on us. And the only... So I had been seeing what was going on there and some people were falling over and and I was very curious and I was hungry and thirsty for more, but I wasn't sure. <laughs> I wasn't sure, but so anyways, we the, the night was getting to an end. People were leaving. There was only a few people left and then Wade Taylor started walking out. And my wife and I, we got the courage. We walked to him and we wanted him to pray about our decision about getting married. And he said something that really stuck out to us that he said, yes, I, I, he said, I noticed you when I came in and I was drawn to you. And that really meant something to me later. At that point, I didn't understand it. And then he said, well, hold hands and I'll pray for you. And the moment he said that, I, I'm like, Lord, please protect me if it's not from you. But if it's you, I want it. And it was just, I, I was so quick. I could think that up. And, and so the only thing that I heard him say is, Holy Spirit, come. And that was it. I was, out, I was out in the Holy Spirit and we're out on the floor and and things just really change. I know things change when we were saved, when I was saved, but something changed again. And, and, and my walk with the Lord became deeper and stronger. And so that was that was my experience of uh, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And that was the beginning. Um, let me move on here. The thing of being filled again and again, we see that in the book of Acts. Um, and, and every time it was, you know, they had the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but we find some of these scriptures where, again, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And it looks like it was always in connection with opposition or something that needed to be accomplished. And, and so uh, when they prayed, like, for example, in Acts chapter 4 there, uh, after the persecution, you know, they gathered and they prayed. Uh, mighty prayers, perhaps, and it says the place where they had gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with the Word of God with boldness. So, had the Holy Spirit left them? You know, this is often a question that, well, what do you think? The Holy, you either have the Holy Spirit or you don't. So, are you saying the Holy Spirit left you? Well, um, <coughs> I don't think the Holy Spirit leaves. I really don't believe that at all. But somehow it says it uses this this sentence, this phrase a number of times. And it's like somehow we face certain challenges or, or situations or <clears throat> we have a task to fulfill. And, and we probably have all experienced that and in certain moments. It's like the anointing comes, the spirit of the Lord moves and the authority, the dunamis power of the Holy Spirit is there to fulfill that task. And that's what I feel like what it speaks of being filled again and again. It's in those kind of moments where, where a task needs to be fulfilled and the anointing comes, the spirit of the Lord comes. And I didn't take uh, put that scripture here, but somewhere it speaks of the Lord Jesus. And, and, and it says something like, and the anointing or and the present was there to heal, uh, something like that. I'm sorry, I didn't get that scripture, but it's just, just one of those things that while things are peaceful, whatever, we're doing things, the spirit of the Lord is with us, but it's like, somehow maybe he awakens us or whatever but it's like here it says that and filled they were filled with the holy spirit and we find that a good number of times in the book of acts there and so for me it's one of those things where instead of questioning these things so much it's just like if it's god i want it <laughs> if it's you god and i want it if it's the holy spirit uh then i want it um and obviously we're looking for fruit the fruit of the Holy Spirit, the fruit of our encounters, the um, there needs to be fruit, I believe. And, and as, as I mentioned earlier, there are sometimes people who very easily just talk, oh, God told me to do this, God told me to do that. And, um, and then all of a sudden you realize, well, certain things don't even match up. They did the opposite or... Uh, first, God told them to do one thing. And next thing you realize, oh, they're doing a complete different thing. Well, then what happened? And, and so they will find their excuses or God changed his mind or whatever. I don't know. So I, I believe we need to be, we, we want to see fruit. And um, in John chapter 15, it's uh, Jesus mentioned there that 
that the Father is pleased when we bear much fruit. Um, and I think of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Paul talks about he didn't come to the Corinthians with persuasive words of wisdom, of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power so that your faith would not rest on the wisdom of man, but on the power of God. And I think of ministering the word and, and just allowing the spirit of the Lord to, to move through you. And, and uh, I almost feel like I, I, I didn't complete maybe everything yesterday where I ministered. Um, I, after, after my message there, the worship team did a powerful song or, or a song. I just felt that it was powerful in a ways. And, and I was thinking I should ask the pastor to, to invite people to pray for them or, you know, just come to the altar. But, but I didn't, I wasn't very sure. And I left it and thinking, well, maybe the Holy spirit was leading me to do it. And I didn't. And when I, when I experienced these kind of things, I always beat myself up a little bit later <laughs> and I feel bad about it. But, uh, uh, so anyways, I, I know the Lord will forgive, but I feel bad when I miss those kind of things because later some comment was made by somebody. I just thought, yeah, I should have done that, what I felt like I should have done. But um, anyways, next time. But um, we've, we've had some of these amazing experiences where we minister and just remain in the presence of the Lord and allow the Lord to move. And we have some of these experiences with the Fulani children in our church in our school who uh, we, we minister the word and we then just spend time in worship and begin to pray and especially this one meeting where we just begin to see I begin to see that the Lord was doing things in, in some of the different children there and and it was among some of the airways and I think there was one Konkomba girl as well but the Fulani children is what really stuck out to me because the next day they began to tell me one of them saw angels and the other one said yeah me too but i saw one that was very big and uh, the other one said i i saw jesus on the cross and, and so just different things like that and i know those children may not know much of what i spoke that evening i hope they remember some but i know they will not forget that encounter because the next day they talked to me about it and and they said brother jake we want you to help us pray for our parents um, and I and I just know these encounters, they are real. Um, the fruit that we see in their lives, um, I, I know that what they saw was real. I know their encounters are real and genuine. And uh, just because of what we, we see the change in their lives. And like one of these girls, she just, she said that she was just making fun of people that were talking about Jesus in the Bible. She had one dream at, on our property there. She had one dream and just everything changed. She got baptized. And so... Um, I think it's important that when we minister that we give the Holy Spirit room to, to, um, to, to manifest. I don't know if that's the right word. Some people don't like that word, but just that, that the, the ministry of the Holy Spirit can take place and he can speak to and, and lead in prayer and, and, and just allow people to encounter him. And so sometimes it takes more time than when we like to close, but um, his time is the best. Um, the end time of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. You all know that scripture. And um, I have a few people that I chose that I read and studied. There's quite a number of them, but I just have three of them here. You know, probably all know of Yvonne Roberts, his encounter, face-to-face -face encounters. And for the space of four hours, I was privileged to speak face-to-face -face with him as a man speaks face-to-face -face with a friend. Every morning, he experienced God like this for four months. That's what he said. <clears throat> and, and that's what it said in his writing. And we know the fruit of his ministry, um, you know, we see in himself how he, he says, I felt in it and it seemed to change all my nature and I saw things in a different light and I knew that God was going to work in the land and not in this land only, but in all the world. And so we know about the Welsh revival, how the Lord mightily used him. And it was a result of this kind of encounter that he had with the Lord. Charles Finney, I mean, he has a long long story of his encounter of what all happened and how it all went and um he says there was just one little phrase here he says there was no fire and no light in the room nevertheless it appeared to me as if it were perfectly light so it was the light of the lord that he noticed in there and i went in and shut the door after me it seemed as if i met the lord jesus christ face to face and 
He talks of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Um, actually, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I think, is the, the other person. Um, Smith Wigglesworth, Charles Finney. He has many things. It's just a, a long story of his experience with the Lord. But this thing of, he says, I met the Lord Jesus Christ face to face. That's how it seemed to him. And we know the fruit of his ministry, right? Uh, there's this this uh, familiar story where he walks into a factory, into a cotton factory, and and just by his sheer presence, the people fall under the under the 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 conviction of the Holy Spirit. They they are convicted of their sins, and and the the factory owner commands the the factory to be shut down, and basically says, you know what, this is more important than the factory work. So they meet and and minister, and people get saved, and so that was the result of his encounter. Smith Wigglesworth, uh, everyone has their own unique stories, right? And so he was hungry for God. And he says, um, I said to Miss, yeah, so he hadn't had an experience, but he says he doesn't have it at home. He says, I said to Miss uh, Body, the vi uh, vicar's wife, I am going away, but I have not received the tongues yet. She answered, it is not tongues you need, but the baptism. I have received the baptism, sister. I protested, but I would like to have you lay hands on me before I leave. She laid her hands on me and then had to go out of the room. The fire fell. It was a wonderful time as I was there with God alone. He bathed me in power and he received the gift of tongues. So anyways, it's a long story, a bit of a story, but he, he uh, sends a telegram to his wife and says that he's re received the gift of tongues and he's spoken in tongues. And his wife basically says, I want you to know that I don't speak in tongues and I have the spirit just like you and uh, so on. But anyway, she sets the whole thing up and says that we'll find out on Sunday because he used to not be able to speak well publicly. Um, he would leave it to the wife. And uh, it even speaks of him just breaking down and weeping in public to minister. And so anyways, his wife sets it all up. So he, he's going to preach on Sunday. We'll see what what is in it. And so anyways, he gets up to speak while his wife sits in the back and and she begins to move back and forth because the spirit of the Lord is on this man and he speaks boldly. And he, uh, she's just wondering what in the world happened to, to my Smith, my Smith, what has happened to him? And so anyways, the result is, uh, you know, many people get saved and are, have the encounter of God and then his ministry grows and obviously people get saved and healed and so on. And so just the fruit of encounters there. <clears throat> um, I'll just go through this a bit quick. I'll try to stop at 930 here. Uh, I say 930. That's Ghana time. I'm not in Ghana now. <laughs> um, in 10 minutes here. So I, the other part I wrote here is about 12 ways that the Lord speaks. And uh, just to cover some of the main ways that the Lord speaks. And um, it's been, it seems like a real blessing for some people to, to hear this in uh, my circle of friends. People have commented on it quite, quite a bit when I first put that out. <clears throat> and I went through it again and, and looked through some, you know, the scriptures and, and uh, just really felt that it was part of this whole whole thing of encounters with God, believing that God speaks. And then many people find it challenging. Well, how does God really speak to us? And, and I think sometimes pe God does speak to people and they, they even respond perhaps to the Holy Spirit's leading and so on, but often don't realize, oh, okay, this is actually God. This is the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> so just this whole idea of walking with the Lord, uh, walking with God, uh, with the Lord Jesus, with the Holy Spirit, and the whole thing of the, the, the rhema word, needing a word for the moment. <clears throat> and so the first one is obviously the word of God, the written word of God. And I believe when we read it in the same spirit that it was written in, it becomes alive and active and sharper than any double-edged sword. And, and yes, it's also for reproof and training in righteousness and so on. Um, and so when I had the word about coming to Ghana, uh, after I had that experience when the man spoke to me and, and saying that what you're going to do is different than what you have been doing and you know what it, what it means and I don't he says but that very week I was preparing for youth ministry and and I was in Jeremiah 29 verse uh, I think 10 to 14 12 to 14 those those verses preparing for the evening message and I was just so very clear and I always believe it was the Holy Spirit to go to verse 7 and what that scripture says is um, to to seek the welfare of the city I've sent you and pray unto the Lord in their behalf and in their welfare you will have welfare and um, it sounds like a prosperity message, but that was a scripture the Lord gave me. And this is one of those things, again, I had somebody just immediately bop back and say, well, that scripture was for Israel. 
when they were in uh, taken captive to Babylon, you cannot apply that scripture. And so, but I know there's the thing of God using the scripture to speak to you and, and uh, just the whole, you know, there's three different ways of perhaps of interpreting scripture. And, and I just know that I know the Lord gave me that scripture. And, I, and to me, it makes sense. It made sense to me to help the people in Africa, to help seek their well-being, to pray unto the Lord on their behalf. And agricultural was one of the things. So there's physical things that we do, boreholes and so on. And I just knew the Lord had spoken. He used the scripture. He used a man to speak to me. And the Holy Spirit led me. And so different ways. But the word of God, I believe it's very important that we are in the written word of God. We read the Bible and honor the, the written word of God, the scriptures. Impressions. I think that's very, very often some impressions. Sometimes maybe we're not sure, but as we mature more and more, I believe we we learn to recognize this more often. And, and we find this in in um, the book of Acts where the apostles says, say, you know, for it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you no other, no greater burden than these essentials. And it had to do with um, uh, which church was it, which group, but it was the Gentiles. Somebody was teaching that they were to be circumcised and, you know, the whole story there, but, and, and such contention arose and it was brought to the apostles and, and they decided on four basic things. And so they said, it seemed good to the Holy spirit and to us. And so sometimes I think we just, we call it impressions. I think it was Rick Joyner that called that impressions. And I've clearly had times where I just felt of the Lord something. And there's one of these times when we had drilled, two boreholes in a village, totally dry, totally, totally dry. I had been there myself when we were looking for the water and, and it just failed. And I had left when the driller called me, he says the second borehole was dry. And somehow I just, I, well, he was on the phone, I was on the phone and I just told him, you know what? There's one man that claims to be a Christian in that village, the rest of the Muslims, uh, although now we have a church there, praise God. But there was that one man, I said, take that one man and take the pastor that was from a different village and you gather, get together and pray. I believe the Lord will lead you and I believe you'll get water. Throw one more bowl. We will, we will put the money out there for that. And so the pastor had left. So he was alone with this one man. And uh, so sure enough, they drilled and they had water. So when we came and we did the opening and the whole village was there, this driller was there and he testified. He said, yeah, when you called, so there's the tree. We st stood underneath that tree, tree and we held hands and we prayed and, and we went there to drill and there's water. So it was just, just one of those things. There was no voice. There was nothing. It was just at the moment. Uh, that was my impression. And, and I just, I'm the kind of person that I like to just say, well, that was the Holy Spirit. That was God. Honor him for it. Respect him for it. So we're, yeah. Peace of God. Sometimes just the peace of God. I just sometimes I'm not sure what to do. Just, okay, there's peace in a certain direction. I think often it's, or sometimes it's just a peace of God and we know, okay, we're in the right place. <clears throat> um, Mel Tari that wrote the book, uh, Mighty Wind, Like a Mighty Wind. He says that, you know, sometimes God just puts circumstances there or there are circumstances and sometimes he speaks through them. And so I think it's important that we, in all our ways, we acknowledge the Lord and he will make our path straight. Um, speaks through people, through prophets. Um, we probably all know scriptures, many, many scriptures on this, uh, many times in, this, in the New and Old Testament. Um, yeah, let me see here. Uh, through people, yeah, God speaking through people or prophets, and it doesn't have to be a prophet all the time that is a so called prophet. Paul, though, says that we may all prophesy, right? And so, uh, I wanted to leave a job, a tobacco job, years ago. And I just wanted to leave. I wanted to get out of there and had a perfect opportunity. But anyways, it was through a man. The Lord said, stay where you are. Relax, stay where you are. And at the right time, I'll move you on. So um, but let me see the, the, the other one here. Uh, my daughter, Rachel, speaking to uh, a missionary lady that was at our place. My daughter, I think, was, I don't know, three years old, five years old. I forget. She was just a, a little kid. And Mama Cindy's there with two phones. She has them in her hands, both of them. One is a much better phone than the other one. And she wants to give one to a, a Pastor Apia, whom we know. And uh, we didn't know about it. But uh, anyway, she's struggling in her mind. She wants to keep the good one, but she feels like she should give the good one to Apia. And all of a sudden, Rachel comes in. 
She has the two phones there and she picks up the good phone. She says, this one is for Apia. Puts it back down, picks up the other one. Says, and this one is for you. Turns around and walks out. She had no idea. Rachel had no idea. Absolutely no idea what was going on. But Cindy got the message, which one she was supposed to give to Apia. But the Lord spoke through a small little child. And God speaks through people. Visions of the heart. Uh, Rick Joyner call, calls them visions of the heart. And um, we have a building where we are building our school now. We just, um, I somehow, I just felt like I, I saw a building there. It was an open vision, but I, that's what I pictured as, as visions of the heart. And in, in the sense, I have a vision of the building there. It's not there. I don't have an open vision, but I, I, I would always see a double story building when I thought of that particular place. One day, a lady said, I had a dream. You had a story building there. And uh, one day, somebody else said, uh, Jake, as I was praying for you, I saw a story building. And he described where so yeah, it's the right place. So yeah, I, I know we're not building there yet, but eventually. And uh, right now, we're up to roofing stage of the, the, it's a third story, the school that we're building there. And I really believe, you know, we have a day school there, but I really believe there's going to be a lot of Bible school happening there, school, hopefully school of the spirit. And um, even the children that we have there, I, I consider that. Uh, raising a generation for the kingdom of God. And then when there's open visions, many scriptures about open visions, and I've had visions of not many open visions at all, but about uh, tractors. It's just interesting that it was a tractor, but it had to do with uh, ministry here in Ghana for us. Dreams, very similar. Trances, um, I have not had this experience, um, but we know the story of Peter when, when he was called to uh, go to the Gentiles, the whole story of the sheet come down with animals on it, and God says, uh, you know, kill and eat and so on. And, uh, and it's picked up and, and it's called a trance. And it's like, it's like a vision, but it's also like in reality happening as something is happening that's not actually happening, but it's happening. <laughs> um, yeah. So it's another way the Lord still speaks to people. I, I know of people, and I believe Rick Joyner's had this and, and others. Um, the audible voice of God. It's another one of those I've not experienced, and, and, um, but I believe it is happening. I know of several people who, who share of God's audible voice, um, that God has spoken to them. And uh, I love Psalm 29, 3 to 9, that speaks of the audible voice of God. Uh, just an amazing scripture there. And we have angelic visitations. Um, I've not seen angels, but I've seen the flashing light of an angel's um, quite a number of times and I just I always know that angel is around when that happens whether one or more I don't know but uh, and it seems that within that moment you just know there's somewhat of God's presence and, and there's a purpose in it and I know at one time it was that angel that showed up and, and the Lord spoke to me through the person that was with me about my children's future being secure in his hands and so um, and so we know like in the case of Cornelius uh, he sees an angel of the Lord, and it's like they have a conversation there, just like a man would have with a man. And uh, so we know of people, actually a very conservative man, <laughs> very conservative man, a friend of mine, that uh, he had this experience of three angels coming into a hotel room, sitting on a couch, on, on a bench that was there, uh, a place of seating, and, and they guided him and told him step by step what to do in the next day's meeting. That was a very, very challenging meeting for him. And uh, he's a very from a very conservative church. You know, like <laughs> I was just shocked that he shared it with me, what's, what happened. And it's just recently. So uh, this still happens. And praise the Lord. And then the appearances of the Lord. And um, I think I'll. This will be my end here. I'll have a little conclusion, but the appearances of the Lord. And, and there's so many, in the, in a, quite a lot of them in the Bible, of course, in the Old Testament, the angel of the Lord and um, face to face and so on. Um, in the New Testament, um, you know, Paul being caught up into the third heavens. And it's like he says, he can't really describe certain things. But anyways, um, I know of a number of people who have had experience with the Lord showing up or them seeing the Lord in different forms, different ways. But the the only experience I've had with that is when in 2008, in, there was a bit of a concern about the election in Ghana. And it was that very night that Ghana had the election and Obama was elected as president. 
um, but I <clears throat> I was not into politics, didn't understand anything much uh, at all about nations and kingdoms. And anyway, I went to bed that night and it was around midnight where I was woken up and it was like a liquid weight in my body. And that's the only way I can describe it. And I right away knew it had something to do with the US. And uh, it was just like that weight was there. And then I saw the Lord. And, and like, as I, I'm not sure whether he was there in person, whether it was a vision, but it's like, I saw the Lord standing there with his arms open uh, like this. And he didn't say anything, but the scripture that came immediately was where Jesus says, how often I've desired to gather you as a hen gathers its chicks, but you would not. And, and so I wasn't looking for this and I'm not one of these that's into politics at that time at all. And, and, and about US or Canada or Mexico or nations, I wasn't against the US or for the US really, just we had friends there and so on. But so there's anyways, it was in 2008 and, and I realized that, well, when I looked back, I felt like I had a little, little bit of the weight of God's heart for America for a moment there. And uh, anyways, within that experience, at one point I asked the Lord, where are we heading? And it was just interesting to me immediately. It was so clear, Armageddon. Anyways, that's a whole other story. But from that moment, from that encounter, I began to study the scriptures and, and, and quite a lot of things. I saw them in a different light. And I began to, to study and, and understand kingdoms and, and God being interested in nations and, and, and so on. I began to, to see a lot of things very, very different from that time. And, and that was kind of like the, the fruit of that encounter of seeing the Lord and, and just realizing his heart for America. And, and I believe for all nations, but it was specifically at that moment for America. Um, and it just, uh, I've often interceded at that time and, and con from that time coming, just been praying for America. And of course, uh, there are some other nations like Canada and Mexico. I was born in Mexico and then lived in Canada for a good long time and um, have my Canadian citizen and we, we travel as Canadians. And so, um, but yeah, I just begin to see things very differently after that encounter. And I believe that's what happens with encounters. It changes us. It challenges us. Um, it encourages us. And there's great fruit. Um, and through our encounters, I mean, the Lord has spoken in many different ways. And, and it was just this whole scripture of let him who has ears to hear, let him hear what the spirit says. Jesus said that many times. And um God has spoke, spoken to us many times and led us in ways. And it, that's why we're in Ghana, we, why we have church, why we have school, um, why we have ministry to the Muslims. I had a specific word in the beginning when we were coming to Ghana. Somebody says that the Lord is going to use you to minister to the Muslims. And I tried at times and it didn't really work. There wasn't much fruit there. A couple of them gave their lives to the Lord, but it was like I, I didn't see it happening yet. And when the Lord opened up the ministry to the Fulani people in the village, and all of a sudden one day I'm there in the village, in the Fulani village, they're all Muslims. And I just, th these words come to, you know, it's like they're being spoken again. The Lord is going to use you to minister to Muslims. And it was just one of those things that helped me to know that, yes, this is one of the areas that I need to put time and effort into and minister to the Muslims. And, and I'm so glad I had that word because if we had not made an effort, um, maybe we would have not accomplished what we have. And some of these young youths and children probably would have not come to the Lord. I don't know. But anyways, the fruit has, some fruit has been there now. And so uh, God encounters should, it, it, when, when there's God encounters, it transforms us, it challenges us. And, and there's a lot of fruit, I believe, with, especially when we see and study other people's encounters. And so uh, praise the Lord. I think I'll stop here. And uh, hand it over to you, Dr. Nancy, and see what you want to do with this. <laughs> this is awesome. Would you pray for us? Uh, yeah, let's pray. Lord God, we thank you that you are the God of encounters. You're the God of heaven and earth, the God that's real, that's tangible, and that we can experience you, that we can feel your love, we can feel your presence. We know indeed that you are true and that you're real. And it's not just theology, it's not just theory, but it's reality. 
and that you are so involved in our lives, in each one of our lives that are here. And so I just pray that uh, mm. encounters would become a, even a greater reality to all of us. And uh, Lord, we are um, we are open and we anticipate even more because we know that you desire them too. You desire to speak to us. You desire to do things in our lives. And you know what we need even more than we do. Even before we ask, you already know. And so, Lord, I pray, give us hearing ears, give us seeing eyes, and quicken our hearts, we pray. And we welcome you to have your way in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.